Uh, Dr. Robert Krikorian is Director of Analytic Standards at the Department of State. He earned a PhD in History and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University, where he was an associate of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Um, he has also uh, taught at Harvard University and George Washington University and uh, lectures regularly at the Foreign Service Institute and throughout the U.S. government. Uh, Dr. Kikorian has published extensively on the modern history and politics of Armenia and Eurasia, including the co-authored book, Armenia at the Crossroads, uh, Rutledge, published by Rutledge in uh, 1999. Uh, his talk uh, will deal with Armenian memory versus Soviet state, the First Republic remembered 1988-1991. Dear friends and colleagues, this paper is part of a larger project that I undertook many years ago to help me make sense of the events I witnessed and participated in during the 1988-1991 period. While there are still many questions that remain unanswered and many aspects that remain unexplored, please accept this paper as a modest contribution to the discussion on the First Republic. My fundamental thesis is that the February 1988 Sumgait massacre essentially nullified a tacit social contract between the Armenian people and the Soviet government in which Armenian loyalty to the Soviet state was exchanged for Soviet guarantees of the physical safety of Armenians. This understanding was based on a reading of history formulated by the Soviet state and articulated by Soviet Armenian intellectuals in which Russia slash USSR appeared as the only credible force capable of preventing the destruction of the Armenian people. After Sumgayit, the grand narrative of Armenian history was reinterpreted by intellectuals and increasingly by the population at large which led to a fundamental rethinking of Armenia's previous experiment with independence from 1918-1920. Historical narratives played an important role in the undermining of Soviet rule in Armenia during the final years of the Soviet Union. Competing non-communist interpretations of history influenced large segments of the population, which in turn led to a divorce from Sovietism and ultimately to secession from the USSR. History was contested terrain over which battles were waged for the hearts and minds of the nation. In the Armenian case, history was a tool for mobilizing the resources of the nation in its struggle against Soviet central authorities as well as its neighbor, Azerbaijan. History matters and people's perceptions of historical events play an important role in shaping policy agendas. The collapse of communism in the USSR is most often ascribed to political, economic, and or social factors. While these factors are indeed vital in understanding events that led up to the disappearance of the Soviet Union, they miss a more fundamental point. Soviet legitimacy, in part, was based on a falsified and distorted interpretation of history. When this interpretation was questioned, Soviet legitimacy was undermined. The Soviet subversion of history in Armenia and responses of Armenian intellectuals are central to understanding the unprecedented events of 1988-1991. Most of the leading activists and many of the supporters of the democratic movement were intellectuals, including many historians such as my friend here today, Dr. Amatuni Virabian. Historians and other intellectuals played an instrumental role in situating the national democratic movement in the context of Armenian history and in mobilizing the general population to come out in support of it. Historical symbols, which were such an important part of the democratic movement, made, exploit, ex, excuse me, made explicit the connection between past and present. Many historical works, the publication of which was aided by the de facto 
and end of the state monopoly or on publishing drew connections between the past and present. History was ever present and frequently invoked uh, and frequently invoked and frequently invo uh, invoked uh, to justify the struggle for democratic and national rights. It is in this context that I would like to turn specifically to the First Republic of Armenia and the role its memory played in reviving thoughts of Armenian statehood. The discussion of the 1918-1920 independent Republic of Armenia was closely connected to and occurred simultaneously with the reinterpretation of events surrounding the liberation movement and 1915. This was understandable as many of the leading figures of the liberation movement went on to play important roles during the independent republic. Moreover, the foundation of the republic occurred in the midst of war and revolution and was conditioned by the ongoing genocide against the Armenians. As we all know, Armenia became a Soviet republic in December 1920 as a result of a joint Turkish-Bolshevik assault. The new Bolshevik rulers inherited a devastated and exhausted country and needed to quickly establish their legitimacy and consolidate their rule. One method of legitimizing their rule was to employ a tactic perfected throughout all the lands of the former Russian Empire. This was to discredit and delegitimize the rule of the predecessor regime, in this case, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. As Marxists, the new Bolshevik leaders found the ideology of the Armenian nationalist an anathema, and they lost no time in labeling the Dashnaks as bourgeois nationalists, imperialist lackeys, narrow-minded chauvinists, and irresponsible adventurers. These are all in quotes. They blamed the Dashnaks for the loss of independence and credited the Bolsheviks with saving Armenians from sure destruction at the hands of the Turks. By discrediting the previous regime, the Soviets were able to gloss over the uncomfortable fact that they had allied with the Turks who were responsible for massacring Armenians and then jointly invaded and occupied an independent state. The Bolshevik alliance with Kemal's nationalists was ignored in Soviet historiography, while the alleged voluntary unit, union of Armenia and the new Soviet Russia was stressed, stressed instead. The Soviets portrayed the leaders of the independent republic as inexperienced bourgeois nationalists who understood nothing about governance and who were blinded to the reality of Armenia's dire situation by the promises of the Western capitalist powers. They accused Armenia of being an outpost of imperialism that was used to weaken and undermine the Soviet revolution in Russia and drive an artificial wedge between the working classes of Armenia and Russia. The lack of information and the suppression of knowledge in Armenia regarding the independent republic served Soviet interests in several ways. First, it allowed the Soviets to present the Republic as an experiment that failed because of the inexperience and immaturity of its leaders and their inability to prevent a hostile takeover by Turkey. According to the Soviet version of events, the adventurous Dashnaks had initiated a war against the Turks, which ended in the defeat of Armenian forces. Only the timely humanitarian intervention of the Bolsheviks prevented the complete destruction of the Armenian people. This version also served the interest of the Communist Party in Armenia by portraying the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic as the culmination of Armenian national aspirations, thus increasing their own legitimacy. The recounting of the events of 1918-1920 was an important part of the Soviet grand narrative for Armenia, which was reinforced over the years 
through constant and sustained political, excuse me, constant and sustained propaganda, both in the schools and the public sphere. The information that was publicly available about the independent Republic of Armenia was uniformly negative, stressing the nationalist and thus evil character of the fledgling state. Dashnak became synonymous with bourgeois nationalists and ultimate pejorative, as were the terms Musavatist in Azerbaijan, Mensheviks in Georgia, or Basmachi in Central Asia. During Glasnost, however, this Soviet narrative came under sustained criticism in Armenia by both intellectuals and the public, as a vigorous and open debate developed on the nature and significance of the First Republic, the first independent Armenian state since the fall of Cilicia in uh, 1375. The previous lessons transmitted to the population by Moscow through Soviet Armenian historiography were challenged by new interpretations of the First Republic. These new interpretations stressed the important symbolic value of the First Republic as an independent Armenian state. This debate on the First Republic opened slowly at first as historians and the public were hesitant to openly discuss the subject of independence. There seems to have been fear among certain circles of intellectuals that discussion of the independent republic would be seen by Moscow as a sign of disloyalty and possible separatism. Armenians were already being accused of these and other alleged shortcomings because of their support for Artsakh and did not want to exacerbate tensions. The only consistent calls for independence came from the Armenian Self-Determination Union and the supporters of the dissident Barur Hayrikyan. At a public rally on 28 May 1988, a telegram was sent to the Supreme Soviet by his supporters asking for May 28 to be declared Armenian Independence Day. This group had not yet been able to win over mass public support for the idea of independence, though. Throughout most of 1988, the subject of the independent republic was not on the public agenda, but as conflict over Artsakh intensified and an acceptable political solution, resolution seemed far off, attitudes began to change. This change of opinion about independence escalated in the aftermath of the December 1988 earthquake as Soviet authorities prove incapable of alleviating the suffering of the people. This disillusionment with the authorities was heightened by the active participation and organizational skills of members of the National Democratic Movement. Thus, from 1989 on, more emphasis on the First Republic became discernible in the public sphere. This was most noticeable at the regular mass meetings that were held in Yerevan, as symbols of the old republic began to appear. The red, blue, and orange tricolor flag of the First Republic was in evidence, and it was considered a great honor to be chosen flag bearer by the organizer of the mass meetings. Buttons, pins, and other paraphernalia related to the independent republic were also produced in large numbers by activists and distributed at the rallies or sold along the route. Public curiosity grew about this previously forbidden aspect of the Armenian past, which was mirrored by an increase in scholarly interest. One of the more prominent historians of this new approach was Gatrich Sartarian, who wrote extensively in the mass media on the formation and development of the First Republic. He developed and reflected the idea that Armenia's most pressing problems were the result of a lack of statehood, also noting that Armenians needed to be more realistic in their approach to political life and understand that having a just cause was not enough to ensure victory. Sardarian turned to the history of the First Republic in an effort to understand the problems and experiences of an independent state. 
He criticized those who embraced the idea of an independent Armenia without understanding the full implications of such independence. Although he supported the idea of independence, he feared the consequences of precipitous action. He concluded that without a sober assessment of history and Armenia's current situation, Armenians would end the 20th century the same way they began it. This stark warning for caution was echoed in other quarters as well, but in the atmosphere of escalating violence against Armenia and Artsakh, most people concluded that independence would be a better option than continued membership in the Soviet Union. In recognition of the symbolic importance ascribed to the First Republic of Armenia by Soviet Armenian intellectuals, the Soviet Armenian Academy of Sciences elected Professor Richard Tovanisian to membership in 1990. This was one of the very few times that a foreign member was inducted into the academy and was the first time that a foreign historian of the modern period was allowed in. This was a clear signal that Hovanisian's work on the First Republic was considered indispensable for a fuller and more accurate understanding of modern Armenian history. There was much talk among historians for the need to have his work translated into Armenian as soon as possible in order to prepare the nation for renewed statehood. Of course, as you know, they are published now and they're available outside in the foyer. Uh, the new positive image of the First Republic presented by Armenian historians was enthusiastically adopted by the local nationalist and used as a symbol of local autonomy and sovereignty in their struggle against Moscow. Thus, discussion of the First Republic carried an anti-Soviet connotation from the outset. Many local Armenian political activists who identified themselves as Tashnaks mirrored this. Although very few of them actually knew what the ARS political platform was, or what the party's goal were beyond a free and independent Armenia, they nonetheless called themselves Tashnaks. In the highly charged political atmosphere of Armenia, for most people, Tashnak meant anti-Soviet, and being anti-Soviet was equated with being pro-Armenian. In the new spirit of defiance, a reassessment of the May 1918 battles of Sartarabad Bash Abaran and Kara Kilise took place. Soviet historiography had tended to portray these battles as important instances of self-defense, which saved the remnants of the Eastern Armenians from the same fate of extermination that the Western Armenians had suffered. These battles were not viewed, however, in the context of the founding of the independent of Republic of Armenia. Given that Armenian independence was declared immediately after these battles, it seemed an odd omission, but, but one completely in keeping with the ideological needs of the Communist Party. As Soviet legitimacy was called into question in light of the liberation movement and the genocide, uh, likewise, these battles took on an added significance. In addition to their importance as self-defense battles against attempted extermination, they also were presented by historians and accepted by the public as foundational events in the process of restoring Armenian independence. The idea of independence in Armenia was growing as Armenian historians and the public ascribed new significance to the independent republic. As the conflict over Artsakh continued to worsen, and Moscow was increasingly seen in Armenia as unwilling or unable to act as an honest broker between Armenia and Azerbaijan, the reestablishment of an independent state was discussed more frequently. It was in the context of current events that the legacy of the Republic came to be viewed. Part of this assessment consisted of trying to draw lessons as to the root causes of the failure to maintain independent statehood. Historians identify three main causes for the failure of the First Republic to survive. The first cause was directly related to the genocide. With the destruction of the Ottoman Armenians still occurring at a time of the foundation of the Republic, 
and the territory of the fledgling state flooded with refugees trying to escape extermination, the establishment of an independent state was viewed as an astonishing feat in and of itself. The second major factor in the defeat of the First Republic was the attitude and behavior of Lenin and the Bolshevik party, including Stalin. Bolshevik collusion with Kemalist Turkey in the dismemberment of Armenia only served to delegitimize Soviet rule even further. The third factor identified by Armenian historians was the indifference and contradicting contradictions among the great powers. The promises to and end Ottoman oppression extended to the Armenians during the war led many Armenians to believe that their hour of liberation was at hand. These promises went unfulfilled, however, as the interests of the great powers took precedence over and moral obligations they may have felt for the plight of the Armenians. Despite the failure of the independence experience in 1920, the leaders of the National Democratic Movement, backed by the overwhelming majority of the population of Armenia, decided to embark on the path of independence once again at the end of 1991. This decision was based on the belief that the Armenians could only defend their national interest as an independent state. The leaders and people of Armenia were well aware of the successes and failures of 1918, 1920. They considered the Republic of Armenia's founded at the end of the Soviet era to be the successor state to the lost republic. And to demonstrate this, they reinstated the flag, the national anthem, and coat of arms of the 1918-1920 Republic of Armenia. No clearer message could be broadcast to the world regarding the way Armenians viewed their new state. Thank you.